everybody. Happy uh, Tuesday evening. We're stoked to be here with Paul and Ina from the BDR. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. Welcome. So where are you both calling in from? Tell us where you're at. I'm at my house in Seattle. My two kids are taking a shower so I told them to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And Paul? I'm at my house on Lake Taps. Okay. Where great. is Lake Taps? I don't know where that is. It is south of Seattle, kind of east of Tacoma, uh, between like Tacoma and Enumclaw. Well, I know you have a long commute, but it looks pretty epic from all the, the photos, like especially during the summer of your dog on the paddle board. I mean, it looks pretty epic, so maybe worth the commute. I think so. It's definitely a good place to be, but yeah, pretty rough commute. Awesome. Well, before we get started, guys, I usually just do a little intro. So hi to everyone at home. Thanks for being here again. Um, and anyone who was with us last Thursday, my gosh, that was a really hard decision in the heat of the moment. That's like a lot of pressure to try and solve technical uh, problems during the live stream. So I made the difficult decision <laughs> of just uh, deciding to cut it off. So thanks for bearing with us for those few minutes. And we're excited to have Quinn back on Thursday. Um, that was a real bummer. But, you know, at, like afterwards, I was pretty upset for about five or 10 minutes. And then I just realized this is part of it. Like this is part of live streaming. It doesn't always go perfect. So um, yeah, we're really excited to round out the tour. We thought it was going to be with Paul and Ina, but I guess it will be with Quinn on Thursday. Uh, it's been really, really awesome hanging out with everybody twice a week. And Paul, like we were talking about, it's been like my only reason to shower twice a week. <laughs> we, have to get our shit together. we have to get our shit together twice a week to do these things. Yeah. Outside of that, it's like, we're a bunch of hippies living in the woods. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so normally we start out with a community spotlight, but I guess that's not really necessary tonight because that's sort of the, the point of having you guys on is to uh, talk about the BDR. And I, I would just, I think it's awesome that we're going to have everybody here watching and sort of educated a little bit more on like how to ride responsibly, what exactly the BDR does more than just providing routes. Because I think for a lot of people, that's all they, that's all they really think about. They don't really go much beyond, um, you know, riding the routes themselves. So speaking of which, I, I, I want to, uh, so thank you guys. I just want to echo yeah, what Ash said. Thank you so here. much for being here. This is really cool. We're very excited about this. And um, my, so my personal history with the BDR, I, I first heard about a backcountry discovery route. I think it was around uh, 07 or 08, and it was the Oregon one because uh, I, I was at the time I was living in Eugene, and I was going to go on a. I, I was doing adventure rides with my buddies from Hood River, 
And one of them said, hey, we want to try this thing called the Oregon Backcountry Discovery Route. <laughs> and he said, but, but you got to go get the maps. And the, the, the dude that has the maps is like somewhere near Eugene. And he, so he sent me on this mission to this house. And, and I went there and I paid some money and I got a booklet of paper maps. And now this is like, whatever, 13 years ago. I barely remember the details, but this booklet. And I was like, well, what are we going to do with this? You know, and, and, it, and in it were some GPS coordinates, but you had to hand enter all the coordinates. And, and we, we did that. We, we hand entered them all, which was very cumbersome. Um, and went out and actually had this amazing trip. Uh, but uh, we hit a lot of dead ends, uh, private property. We ran into some places where uh, the roads had been deliberately mangled by property owners and stuff like that. Like they put trees down around them or they chewed them up with an excavator. Um, so we couldn't cross and had to do long backtracks. It was, it was sort of an unusual thing. And I was like, what, what is this? You know, where does this come from? Um, so we had a great trip and we tried a few of the other things that were in that book. But um, then I found out about the Washington green dot routes, which was a thing that was also kind of around around that era, but also not really well maintained. Um, and we tried some messing around up there. But then suddenly uh, at some point, and I don't remember really when I became aware of what we now consider the backcountry discovery routes, but suddenly things started getting a whole lot easier with backcountry discovery routes. And <laughs> We started getting these like routes and maps and things like that. And the trips got infinitely better and easier. And, and we didn't have the dead ends and the turnarounds and the, the chewed up roads and stuff like that. But I didn't really know much. I wasn't in the industry at the time. Um, but uh, so and then eventually, of course, I became aware of the BDR organization, the fundraisers, you guys, the leadership and all this stuff. So that's my own personal path with the BDR. And now I don't have nearly I don't have nearly as deep of a, a path with it, I guess. But for me, I learned about the BDR going to the tour tech rally. I was just like one of those zany new riders who like anytime I would even see an adventure bike, I would like run into the restaurant and like hunt the person down, like look for the helmet and be like, hi, I ride too. <laughs> you know, so the tour tech rally was really exciting for me as a new writer and then uh you know the bdr coming from the tour tech rally and living in washington you know i was up in everett so the washington bdr was my first and i will never forget ina like my girl crush with you began probably in 2013 or 14 when uh the arizona film premiere happened in seattle i just like had such a great night that night and i remember sitting in the theater and watching and watching you go up and do the q a and um, yeah, the BDR has been a huge part of my, uh, my journey with adventure riding too. So, so yeah, that, that's cool. I didn't, th I didn't know we were going to do that, but that is kind of a cool. I mean, I think everybody in adventure riding knows about the BDR. So we're going to shut up and let you guys talk now, but it, it, it uh, is this huge <laughs> thing for our sport. So, so maybe we could just start with, if for anybody out there who's never really thought about where these routes come from and stuff like that, what is the BDR? You know, why don't you take that one? Sure. Um, so BDR, Backcountry Discovery Routes, is a nonprofit organization. We're 501c3. Uh, and our main goal is to create and preserve adventure motorcycling opportunities uh, for the ADV community. Um, you know, we, our mission is fivefold. You know, number one is creating these routes and providing travel resources for people and making it easy for anybody who wants to go and explore the backcountry of the United States to go and do that. Um, you know, a lot of the times when people think about adventure riding, we think about riding to faraway places, to South America, you know, Africa taking uh, six months of work. Uh, but really, the, the greatest thing about the BDR is that um, there's so many amazing places in the United States. So the organization makes it easy uh, for people to go and have an adventure of a lifetime and maybe only take 10 days out of um, their work life. Um, but really... Uh, go really deep into these beautiful places in the mountains, in the forests, camp with your friends um, and, you know, um, have an amazing uh, adventure. Uh, so then we, you know, through our photography, professional photography and films, we inspired people to go and discover um, the back country. And then we also have, um, we advocate, we're basically a voice for adventure motorcyclists in the community. We work with land managers, um, and public agencies responsible for managing these lands. Um, and so we are sort of a voice for adventure motorcyclists um, in, in the community between these uh, agencies and, and uh, um, organizations that manage the land. Uh, we also educate people about safety, um, you know, and being good stewards of the land, uh, how to pack in and pack out, you know, um, how to, uh, you know, uh, 
when we, we when we ride, be respectful to the communities that we go through. Um, so ride right and ride respectfully are um, two of the safety and education campaigns that we currently have. Um, and then really uh, the, the final uh, mission is the economic impact that we provide to these local communities. Um, you know, our routes go through some of the most remote parts of the country. Uh, these rural communities that maybe have, you know, uh, 300 people living in this little town and there's one gas station. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, these little communities might have lost uh, mining or logging economies. Uh, but all of a sudden there's an influx of a thousand people going through their little town. And so, you know, we're spending money on gas and in hotel on hotels. And so all of a sudden, you know, we're bringing economic impact into these uh, local communities. But then uh, on the other side, uh, <clears throat> these people become the advocates uh, for keeping these roads open that lead through their little town. You know, so when the Forest Service comes and says, hey, we need to close this road, it's not being utilized. The locals are the ones who are going to say, you know, my livelihood depends on these people and these BDR routes going through my town, so we need to keep these, these roads open. Um, so those are, you know, five main missions of the organization. Uh, if we can, I have a quick question there. I don't want to get too far off. I know, I know you have a little bit of a plan, but I do have a question. If there was one thing that you could tell every single writer, like if there was a gate at the beginning or the end, you know, wherever, if someone is entering a BDR, if there was something that you could tell every single person before they started the route, as far as like uh, the education aspect goes, what would that, what would that be? I, I know what mine would be. And that is, yeah. uh, let it, let it come to you. Don't. Oh, don't get after it. Almost all of the bad wrecks that I see, they happen in the first half of the first day or like right after lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because everybody's all stoked and you know, you're so excited to be there and with your buddies. And this sometimes it's a competitive thing, but people just get after it too soon. And we almost oh, never God. see accidents or wrecks after like the second day because you're, you're in the zone and you're kind of in the groove. But I, I tell people that I ride with all the time. Just, you know, let it come to you. Take it easy the first day. Just ride 70%. Don't go above 70% for the first day. If everybody did that, there would be, you know, a fraction of the accidents that we currently see out there. I'm pretty sure that you're the person who told me respect the rut, like in my very early riding. And that's something that is stuck with me. And I tell every single person who's like a newer rider that comes out with us because it's so true. And that first day, I always, I'm like super skeptical on a ride the first day. I'm like, I'm just going to hang back here. Like I really want to get after it, but I'm just going to hang back. Cause you're right. Everybody's like hot dog and, and excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, respect the rut is my is one of my favorites, and uh, my second favorite is never trust desert mud. I never trust. So you <laughs> did. So you did say that to me. I'm not. I'm not making that up. Okay. It's been I in some of the films, I think, but yeah, it's anytime you see mud in the desert, it is always just grease. It's this peanut butter oh, grease, that. and it packs your near tire. It's it's the worst thing ever. And you know, up here in the Northwest, we ride in mud. You know, I've done air scrambles and enduros where it was raining the entire time. It's fine, but desert mud, oh my God, it's... Yeah, it's true, it's, it's different. It's the worst. Like, so respect the rut and never trust desert mud. <laughs> yeah. I love it. We're, those good. are words to live by. And Eno, what would you tell, if you if you had to tell, like if you got to tell every person one thing, what would it be? Sorry, I know this is kind of silly, but I like it. No, no. Um... I mean, I guess for me, it's probably <laughs> learn to use your brakes and uh, learn to ride slow. You know, I uh, come, I came into this, all the guys I ride with are really awesome riders. And even though, you know, I've gone to South America and I have over 30,000 miles that I've, you know, ridden on a bike, but I don't ride that often. And usually the first day you're like, oh my God, do I even remember how to ride? But a lot of the times I tend to just have way too much fun and go really fast. And, you know, so like going slow is the new fast for me. So just like taking your time, enjoying, enjoying the views and, and really taking it all in, um, you know, just slow, slow yourself down, I think, uh, mentally and physically as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of the point. And yet when we get out there, the sport of riding kicks in and sometimes Absolutely. it's easy to forget how far we are from the nearest hospital. 
it's so silly how much time I spend in my helmet pretending I'm like a rally racer or something like I don't know what I'm doing I'm not sure it's very dangerous I'm not sure why I, I feel the need to do that <laughs> so you know that was a great uh, a very articulate uh, d overview of the BDR thank yeah. you for that I really appreciate that it um, I think uh, it would not be saying too much to, I, I think we can't possibly overestimate uh, the importance of the BDR to our sport, you know, and, and I feel like it, the BDR organization and what you guys are doing with the BDR and the advancement of adventure motorcycling are just like hand in hand. I, I, it's hard to almost, for me, hard to imagine one without the other, which is a really, really cool thing. But so we want to hear a lot more about how all this came about, but I, I think it'd be very interesting to learn more about uh, the two of you uh, personally, sort of your backgrounds, like, and maybe we could go one and then the other, we could start with Paul, like, um, and just talk about kind of where you're from and your professional career and kind of leading up to uh, the starting of the BDR. Um, and then we'll pause there and then we'll come back to the BDR after we've gotten both of your pre-BDR backgrounds. Does that Sounds work? good. When I was okay. a kid, I had a paper route and I saved up money to buy my first motorcycle, which was an XR100, but my parents wouldn't let me buy motorcycle because they were dangerous. So I've um, spent my whole, most of my career punishing them for that by working in the motorcycle industry and riding motorcycles. <laughs> professionally almost um but i grew up in, in kent so not too far from from here not too far from um Touratech usa i ended up working in the motorcycle industry kind of by accident for bbr motorsports doing marketing and operations um and they did aftermarket parts for little tiny dirt bikes 50s and 110s and 150s and things like that um <clears throat> and I, I like to say once you get in the motorcycle industry you can't get out so um when that sort of segment started to fade. Um, the adventure segment was coming on really strong back in 2009. And I simply answered a Craigslist ad for general manager at Touratech and uh, got the job with Tom and Emo there back in, two, April, it was April 15th, 2009. Um, well, now, and I, I'm gonna, I, I've read your LinkedIn. I'm working, so <laughs> you also had a pretty impressive management background before that before going to bbr and have a degree in business as well in addition yep. to like a lifelong love of motorcycles so you had so when you answered that craigslist ad i would imagine your resume looked pretty appealing to the folks at Touratech. yeah i had done some similar things i've always worked for small businesses but yeah i've always been in operations marketing um yeah degree in business emphasis in marketing so yeah i had some pretty relevant experience and yeah it was a good fit and it has been from day one all the way through now it's it's evolved but it's it's been it's been really good and, and rewarding and then some uh, go ahead oh and you're are you're also a partner in the business right yep. in, towards, say. And, yeah and but you, so you went and somehow you over the period of time you went from answering a craigslist ad to becoming an owner and the ceo how did how has your role developed there over the years so tom who was the original uh, founder of, of our entity he started making little um little map cases and fender bags and things like that with a sewing machine that was in a house that he was renting. And he sort of started the business that way and then was a supplier to Touratech uh, when the catalog was only 16 pages uh, long. And, uh, and then eventually he became the U.S. importer and he, he kind of was one of those guys that did it all. And, and so it was um, the business had really grown and it was ready for someone that had more conventional business background. Tom was an engineer that designed landing gear for Boeing and was super good motorcyclist, passionate. Um, he was, you know, the right guy for the first 10 years. And then um, I was the right guy for the next 10 years. So he's kind of phased out of the business. He's still an owner, still um, emotionally very invested in it, but he doesn't come to the office much anymore. So it's been a good move. And we've just kind of transitioned myself and chemo in into ownership um, over time, um, just to have a stake in the action and to, um, give Tom confidence that we're making good decisions because we're, we're in, involved financially in the business as well. Yeah. Right. We both, yeah, you had a brief stint in the gift industry, right? Uh, at, yeah. at, or, so, so did I, I don't yeah. think we ever talked about that. Did, yeah. I, did we? I worked. No, I, we industry. haven't talked about it. I tried I to forget about it. So great. He shouted that to me while I was getting ready and I was like, what? Are you serious? It's so random. I mean, that's such a completely <laughs> random, odd thing. Like no one would ever look at the two of you guys, either of you, and think, yeah. oh, I know what you did before. You worked in the gift industry. Housewares and, House and, and gift, yeah. And there's the, all the gift shows and gift marts and stuff. I Sometimes yeah. I feel like all the events we do as a business now, like it reminds me of that, that circuit of shows all over the country. And, you mm -hmm. know, every 
every week in a different city. Except you're not selling like fart jokes and old lady <laughs> mugs and weird mm -hmm. stuff like that. <laughs> Those are some of the things my, my old business made. So. Mm, wow. I really prefer motorcycle parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot more manly. <laughs> Thanks for that, Paul. Um, and, uh, you know, I've also looked at your uh, link. We've also looked at your LinkedIn profile. So uh, where are you from originally? Uh, yeah, I grew up in Moscow, Russia, and I came to the United States in my late teens and uh, ended up in Seattle. Uh, and um, then I guess my motorcycle journey started uh, pretty early. Well, I was on two wheels for a long time. I never had a car living in Seattle. Uh, and had a little scooter that I was buzzing around, you know, uh, town for work and stuff. And then um, 2008, I met a guy who, um, who was dreaming of going to South America on a motorcycle and I became kind of a shared dream. And uh, we basically decided we were going to do it and um, quit, you know, did some prep for about a year, saved some money. I uh, did a lot of research, um, you know, read tons of ride reports on ADV Rider, um, and then uh, quit our jobs. And in 2008, I think we just elected Obama and we, we left in November of that year. Um, and then basically traveled from Seattle to Ushuaia, Argentina, to the very tip of South America for six months. Uh, and we were blogging every day and were um, posting an ADV rider. And then basically when I came back after that trip to Seattle, I also answered a Craigslist ad. Uh, and uh, I think Paul just started like a few months before that at TourTech and they were revamping the website. So they were looking for like a web person or marketing person. So I applied to that. They didn't call me for probably three months. And then out of the blue, Paul called and um, brought me in. Um, so I started working with TourTech as a marketing consultant, um, and then eventually it was 2013 when um, they asked me to join BDR and, and help manage the organization. Um, I did have a lot of nonprofit experience. That that's what um, you know. I worked in nonprofits uh, all my life, basically. So kind of a an, an amazing opportunity to bring passion for motorcycling and, and experience in nonprofit. Um, that led me to this job, which is, you know, my dream job. <laughs> and, um, so. Yeah, it seems like a pretty awesome job. You're and your degree, were you you were in the marketing communications, right? Yes. I, I noticed something on your uh, your LinkedIn about a couple of different positions that mentioned art. Mm -hmm. uh, one about working for a company that did art licensing, and then um, it, uh, another uh, poncho. Uh, so, is that an interest of yours, like uh, art, and what kind of art? And, um, I mean, I, I guess I just kind of ended up in the art in arts fundraising. That was a, a, a 40 year old organization here in Seattle. Um, pe local people would know it, but um, basically the organization raised money for the arts, um, arts organizations in the city, the museums and, and theaters and, um, you know, kids arts nonprofits uh, through auctions. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I was interested in art and I and I was helping curate the art auction. We had a few different auctions, wine and gala and art. So um, I, I guess um, it, I just, you know, it just kind of happened. I happened in that industry and uh, but the interests, my interests are there as well in art. I, 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 I really, we really like that because the, the art and motorcycles are two things that, you know, you don't just don't often see mentioned in the same sentence, you know, and so it's kind of neat that, that you have that. We have a friend who has kind of a similar uh, similar mutual interests you know people don't think motorcycles and then art in the same yeah same it's sort of a conundrum like people would be surprised by it just like they would be surprised that oftentimes motorcyclists are real nature people at heart and uh, like people who aren't motorcyclists think that motorcycling is like the opposite end of the spectrum from nature and it's not at all so i think i love that the bdr has taken that on as part of its mission too is sort of reframing people's mindset to, to see that there is like a conservation piece Absolutely. to motorcycling and that it's not as destructive as people like at first glance like to think. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think on the opposite, we want to help, um, you know, uh, help keep these lands open for us to enjoy, but we also need to make sure that we are good stewards that, you know, we, we don't uh, leave our trash around and so that we can come back and enjoy it for generations. Totally. So how did, so, so you've kind of walked us up to this point where you're helping out at tour attack as a consultant and, and we, but we haven't talked about how the BDR started. So how did the, how did, so how do we get from that to the BDR? Where did the initial idea come from? How did this, how did this thing start? 
Well, my history with the BDR doesn't go back as far as yours. So I didn't, I didn't ride the Oregon BDR until 2009. So summer of 2009 is when I got my first experience with it. <clears throat> and I, I had simply started at TourTech USA, had experience in the motorcycle industry, a lot of business experience, but I hadn't really ridden adventure bikes or hadn't ridden adventure bikes at all. I'd actually not even ridden on the street. I'd only ridden off road and on motocross tracks and that. Wow. So just to bring me up to speed on the segment, Tom wanted to go ride the Oregon BDR with me. And I <laughs> said, yeah, that sounds cool. But you know, if we're gonna take a week off of work to go do that, you know, we should get some marketing content. So let's bring a photographer and let's, you know, make some videos and we can show them in our trade show booth and um, help, you know, get the word out there about this form of recreation and using tour tech parts and that. So we, um, he knew Helge was a good friend of him, his Helge Pedersen. So we called Helge and asked him if he wanted to go ride motorcycles on the Oregon BDR for a week. <clears throat> and he agreed. And then we called Sterling who we, who we knew through Helge and invited him to come along mainly just to create some good marketing stuff. And so that was my first experience riding the bike. We went out, we didn't even quite finish it. I think we spent seven days on it or something like that, shooting a lot of photos, um, doing video. I was pretty slow compared to those guys because I was still figuring it out. But we had a lot of fun, made a couple of videos, one that went on YouTube that got seen by a lot of people. And the other we played in the trade show booth in the Tech booth for a few years. So um, <clears throat> that was the, the early days. And then a couple of guys from Seattle saw the YouTube video and they thought, well, it'd be cool to have a, a similar route in Washington. And they were local entrepreneurs, pretty young guys. And so they set out to make a Washington BDR route uh, modeled after the Oregon route. And uh, they had this idea over a beer when they were getting together, just a couple of buddies. And then they there are two pretty successful guys that are used to making things happen. So they started making it happen. They wanted to make a video. So they called the same guy that made our video, which was Sterling. And next thing we knew, we were having lunch with these two guys and they told us about the route. We said, cool, how can we help? And they wanted us to pay for the film. Um, and so <laughs> um, said, sure, I'll pay for the film. And yeah. I said, you know, I'd help organize and, and run things. And so it was just kind of a over lunch that, got started and then it's just kind of gone from there. Was there any thought that it, it uh, for a future for this or was it just sort of like, well, Oregon has one, so let's make one for Washington and it'll just be like this little side project. The initial, the I, the initial <laughs> idea was just to do Washington. Um, but before we film, before we finished that filming expedition, like a couple days before the end, sitting around the campfire somewhere up in the near the Pasayton wilderness um, towards the North end of the route, we were just like, man, this is really cool. What, you know, what could we do next? And I, before we finished that trip, we were already talking about doing Utah. And, uh -huh. uh, and so, yeah, it just kind of snowballed from there. It's so cool how like, I had no idea, you know, when I, when I started riding and came into the Tour Tech rally and then met you and the whole crew up there in Seattle, I, I had no idea how deep all of these, these friendships and how deep all of these uh, relationships went and hearing you tell this story, I'm like, oh my gosh, like all of these names that I've been hearing since I first started riding adventure bikes, like, wow, I can just like, I, it's really a romantic like thought to sit here and think about like you guys all sitting around the campfire dreaming up like, well, what are we gonna do next? And mm -hmm. it's really, really a cool story. Uh, how, uh, when, how were you, uh, distributing the routes that, and like say that, and so the Seattle, Washington was the first, how, how was the, the information once you guys had sort of said, okay, this is what we want it to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you distribute that? We made just GPS tracks available to the community from the, the early on, we wanted it to be a free thing. We didn't want it to be a, a tour attack thing. And so we, um, just built a website and put the tracks for free. You just click the link, download the GPS tracks. That was kind of the end game at, at the time for Washington. And it's, you know, kind of still what we do. It's, it's always been by the community for the community. You know, we um, started out just some guys doing it in tour tech, you know, Tom basically was paying for it all. And I was putting a lot of effort into it, a lot of hours, a lot of volunteer hours, but you know, eventually it, it started, getting this momentum and we wanted to really formalize it. So we uh, created a nonprofit back in 2011. That's when we started the nonprofit and slowly started shifting everything in. And then, you know, a few years later, when I 
um, recruited Ina, it was because the thing had gotten big enough. It was kicking my ass. I just couldn't keep my chin above water anymore. And I didn't ask her to come work there. I asked her to come take it over. And uh, it was just short conversation. I said, I want you to take it over. Um, what you have to do is raise enough money to cover your overhead and cover everything <laughs> that the needs. And beyond that, let's do it, you know? And she, um, she is all, all action. So she just said, yep. And just started kicking ass. And that was. Yeah, you're such a boss. Ago. What's that? I said, you know, you're such a boss. It's amazing. Like it's awesome. It's really, really <laughs> incredible. I mean, to think that the BDR that you, you run for the most part, the BDR like operations, that is you. Yeah, you know? when you when someone calls the BDR phone number, yeah. it rings her cell phone. His phone. You know, well, That's I how know. big of an organization we are. She does everything. And I know you mentioned her nonprofit experience. She was instrumental in that nonprofit poncho that had been around 40 years. And when she left to go ride to South America, within a couple of years, that entity <laughs> ceased to exist. They went out of business. They shut down after Ina left. So um, I remind our board of that all the time that uh, we need to keep Ina. Don't, don't, don't let Ina go anywhere. <laughs> the BDR will not exist. And I'll that's pretty much the case. I have to say really quick, in the comments, it's hilarious. If you see me sitting here laughing, it's because Paul, everybody, so the first comment about Paul was, to ask Paul to tell a joke, he's always so serious. <laughs> so then I was like cracking up laughing and then they're like, what is he looking at? I wonder, does he have YouTube open? Is he reading the comments? Paul, <laughs> smile if you're reading the comments. And then they think that you look like Ryan Villapoto. So I just thought I would ask. Oh, well, he's that. he's a hometown hero, fellow Washingtonian. What, you it? don't know who no, Ryan who is Villapoto that? is? Uh -huh. He's a Supercross <laughs> champion. Oh, oh nothing about racing it is really embarrassing and we've had some interviews with some really famous racers and i, I i'm learning about them and i really think it's amazing what they do but i just don't i yeah. don't know so you guys had jeremy mcgrath on i didn't i didn't watch it but we worked with him at bbr we built a bike for him and he raced some of our bikes in my garage i have a magazine cover of of him on one of the bbr bikes frame oh, cool. from back yeah, in the day the whole idea for this live streaming thing was basically because with all of our shows shut down and stuff, I was like, man, we're going to be really bored and I don't know, what are yeah. we going to do? So I guess maybe we should do a live stream. And then I was like, well, what are we going to talk about? We can't just talk about Moscow stuff. Like that's boring. I don't want to talk yeah. about Moscow. So uh, I was driving home out here to the house and I was like, God, all those racer dudes have been like hitting us up for gear recently. Maybe I can just text them. I'm pretty sure I have all their phone numbers. So I just text all of them like Jeremy McGrath, Destry Abbott. I was like, I'm yeah. just going to text them and ask them if they want to do That's it. Cool. Yeah, we were very curious yeah. like to how all these famous Why racers are, are getting into adventure, adventure bikes? bikes, you know, because yeah. it's not racing. It's so the antithesis of racing. It's and, uh, something so it's we, we see all the time. You know, you can only race for so long and you just, the healing from injury takes longer and you just kind of are over it. Like Quinn says it, he's over going fast. Uh, Mike Lafferty that we rode yeah. with on the Northeast BDR, he's like, man, I, I had to ride fast for 20 years and I am done with it. I am, it, I'm yeah. over it. Yeah, and then I think the camping off the bike like blows their mind more than they yeah. expect. They're like, this is amazing. Like they never understood. Why in the world would you carry all that heavy stuff on the back of your bike? You guys yeah. are crazy. Like you can't go fast. And then they get over going fast, camp off the bike. And this is the next mm -hmm. thing, which is really exciting, I think, for yeah. us. Yeah, well, were you <laughs> got to talk to a lot of you know former champions you know Quinn Cody and Mike Lafferty and uh you know there's been a number of them but they, they all seem to end up here in, in adventure motorcycles you know I think a lot of times they're still involved in the industry and and that's like the place for them is doing motorcycle or you know doing the the demo rides and demo tours and talking to people and it just ends up kind of where where they all are it's pretty funny uh Ricky Johnson yeah, he's a I think a history. multiple time motocross champion and he's called Turatech a few times we've talked to him and he was funny he asked me one day he's like what the hell do you guys put in those boxes like what are people carrying with them because he's just never <laughs> like that. And he just can't imagine what you'd fill up you know boxes with but it's pretty funny <laughs> totally I wonder if everyone as a whole is going to get faster because the racers are coming and so then they're going to teach like Destry Abbott with his school so like is everyone going to get faster because all the racers are coming to adventure riding I mean that's kind of exciting to me I would like to go faster and more wheelies that'd be great were you a racer paul did you uh, did you no. have a background no nope i wasn't even very good at motor riding motorcycles but i've uh, done a lot of bicycle racing road racing cycle cross mountain bike so i picked it up pretty quick but yeah i don't have a big background in it just always liked it 
watching you on Instagram makes me tired. I'm like, you're, you're very, very active. I mean, I like to, I'm pretty active, but like, Jesus, you're real active. Yeah, I, I like to keep moving. You know, I, I, like, like Enid so, tells people, I'm just a paper pusher. So most of my life, I'm just sitting at a desk looking at spreadsheets and signing papers and having meetings. So um, when it's my time, yeah, I like to get out in the trails, bicycle, paddleboard, running. Do a lot of running lately. That's Enid, good. you got some uh, outdoor outdoor hobbies as well besides motorcycles? Uh, you know, I've got two kids uh, and a family. So we do a lot of hiking, backpacking with the family. Uh, I don't get to go riding very often. I mean, basically our annual fundraiser and then the BDR trip is are my two opportunities to ride in a year. Um, so, you know, yoga, tennis, hiking. Um, I, I'm just getting into mountain biking. Um, so that's been very exciting. Usually girls go from mountain biking to motorcycling and I've, I've never really mountain biked. So um, that's my new hobby. You know, well, that's interesting. really exciting. Uh, now we have a lot. Now we have many, many activities to do together. <laughs> almost, uh, almost everybody we've had on the live stream has been a mountain biker. Yeah, it's true. I, I've noticed that really. There's a huge overlap between mountain bike yeah. and riding, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of interesting. So I want to touch really quick. You just mentioned the fundraiser, which I last weekend there was this like gray tinge over my entire weekend because I had my calendar reminders coming up. It was the first year that I personally was going to come to the fundraiser was really excited, but enough about me or our own, you know, sadness. What does this mean for the BDR and how can people, um, how can people donate? I mean, I know the fundraiser is a really big deal. Um, so yeah, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know it, it was really sad for me personally, so I can only imagine how sad it was for you guys and for the organization. Yeah, we, we uh, had to cancel our annual fundraiser. And for those of, of people who don't know, um, one of our sources of revenue is the annual fundraiser, which is a weekend ride. Um, and it happens at different places around the country. Once a year, we find sort of an adventure resort where there's opportunities for good riding and um, lodging and camping. And so during the day, um, Thursday through Sunday during the day we go out riding and then uh, in the evening there's discussions and um, you know talks about the future of the organization and us sort of reporting on what we have accomplished um, in the last year and then um, the big thing that happens at the fundraisers people raise their paddle to donate um, money to the organization and so that's uh, one of our bigger sources of revenue uh, from our large you know big supporters and, and donors individuals uh, who donate. So unfortunately, we had to cancel it this this year. Um, we are working on something, um, uh, a fundraiser, online fundraiser concept um, that we'll unveil um, probably in the fall. And it'll be um, sort of an online thing. And um, we'll probably also talk about the history of the organization since this is our 10th year uh, and a huge milestone. And we were going to celebrate it at the fundraiser. But um, Unfortunately, we'll have to do it uh, vir virtually. Um, so we'll be announcing plans for what, what's gonna happen um, mm -hmm. shortly. The, the cool uh, thing about, about that is, although it was a, a bummer to cancel that event, that event is limited to 60 or 70 people. And a lot of times it's the same people that come every year and they, they do help us raise money, but they also serve as our community steering committee. So we have some people that have been, we have a handful of people that have been to every single one. And we have these open discussions and there's ideas shared and some of the things we, many of the good ideas that we've implemented over the years came from the fundraiser event. Sometimes it was sitting around the campfire, drinking at night, or sometimes it was a question that happened in one of the, the sort of breakout sessions, but it's really a big part of what we do. But the cool thing about that getting canceled <clears throat> is that it's forcing us to do an online version that's gonna be available to everybody. So anybody in the community can participate in that. Like Ina said, we're going to share some of the history. We're going to show some things that have never been seen before. It'll be some live, you know, banter about it. And then we're going to do some, some fundraising and some of the guys that raise the paddle for big dollars. Um, we, you know, we of course know them really well and we, we will be, you know, um, corralling them to make donations like they normally do, but it'll also open it up to anybody that is digging what the BDR is doing. will be able to participate. So I'm actually kind of excited about it, although it was to have that, event canceled it's going to be pretty cool because it'll be open to to everybody and it'll be sometime in the fall 
it's one of the amazing things about, you know, this unfortunate predicament that we've all found ourselves in of, of facing this pandemic and what, what does life look like? What do businesses look like? How do we continue with nonprofit organizations through something like this is that we're being forced to get a little bit creative. And that opens us up to all sorts of new avenues that I think many of them will persist afterwards. So who knows, like maybe some of what you learn this year will actually like be a new evolution of, of growing the fundraiser and raising even more money, which is really neat. And for everybody at home, I've, um, I'm going to like every few minutes, just paste the BDR link um, in the comments. So if you are in a position that you're still thriving through all of this chaos and you have the, the money to donate, please, please do. Um, it's very easy if you go to the website. And Ina, I haven't told you this, but I would love to um, take our registration fee from the, the um, fundraiser and just donate that fee um, instead of like refund or anything like that. So just please donate that to the BDR. Thank you. We appreciate that's it. That's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's really yeah, cool. And, and, you know, another um, <laughs> big way for individuals to support the BDR is through our supporter program. It's an mm -hmm. annual program. Um, you know, 40 adventure brands are participating by giving discounts and gifts, and Moscow is one of them. You guys uh, give one of the better, um, uh, you know, gifts and discounts in the program. But um, there's three different levels of support, and, and uh, you know, by joining, you can get some perks from all these brands but also you um, you know donate money towards the development of uh, and the creation of future out so um, that's a great way to support the organization throughout the year and that's so, probably a good way to stay involved too uh, with just future communication right Paul like you talked about the sort of collaboration of like um, outside ideas and and what this like live stream fundraiser might look like I'm sure if people become part of the supporter program they'll just be more apt to see some of that information so, uh, you know, um, what uh, uh, the funding for the BDR, you meant you kind of talked a little bit about the, the, the fundraiser, you just mentioned individual contributions. What are the different sources of revenue uh, it, looking at the big picture for the BDR? Um, yeah, the, so the supporter program is, is one of them. Uh, the fundraiser and the raise the paddle that happens during that weekend. Uh, we also have a holiday auction. Um, we've been doing it for the last five years. Uh, and that's again, our corporate sponsors and supporters who donate um, you know, gift uh, training packages or products so people can bid on them. That happens during December. Uh, we also currently actually have a uh, sweepstakes, uh, the KTM 790 Adventure R sweepstakes bike, so people can donate for a chance to win um, this uh, KTM 790. Um, and then uh, just actually donations from corp uh, cor you know, corporate support, like uh, you guys, uh, the companies that are in the adventure space that believe in the mission of the organization and support us annually. Um, and then also a small part of it is uh, just donate, straight donations from the community. The, these are 100% tax deductible. Um, so, you know, when people download uh, tracks, there's now an option for them to donate either a dollar, five dollars or twenty five dollars. So um, that, you know, that brings some revenue to us on a daily basis as well. Uh, and then a little bit from the sales of the films that we do. Um, so th those are kind of the main revenue sources. No, I Add one thing real quickly that um, we just became a 501c3 this year. So prior to that, we were a C4. The distinction is um, donations are, are tax deductible now, but also um, we can receive money from charitable trusts or family trusts. And also um, employer match is, is now an avenue for us. So if you're out there and you work for a bigger company that has a uh, a nonprofit match program. You can talk to the HR department and you can arrange it so that your $100 donation gets matched and becomes $200 from your employer. So that's something that's new to us. So we haven't really got the word out on that yet, but we're, we're, that's one of the projects Ina and I are working on. Um, do you, uh, how does the money uh, get spent? How, how, once you've raised it, where, where does the money go? Um, so mainly, you know, it goes towards the program, which is the deliverables to the community. Um, uh, films like uh, things like crowd development, films, cre film creation. Um, we also have an uh, access and advocacy fund. So we work with, we support other nonprofit organizations that do um, work on the ground. They're boots on the ground, you know, uh, Trails Preservation Alliance, Corva, Nimova. Um, so we, on an annual basis, make donations to these organizations. So they 
kind of become our ears and eyes, you know, if there's something going on um, near the route or in the state where we have a route, we, we have the funds to help, um, you know, support the, uh, lobbying uh, activities to keep the uh, trails open. Um, we also do a lot of community outreach and, you know, we attend shows, uh, put on events. So anything that has to do with, um, you know, things that we deliver to the community, meeting people um, and so forth. Uh, web, keeping up the website uh, and all the planning resources on the, um, on the website. People don't really realize, you know, we create one route a year, but there's now 10 routes that we actively managing. Uh, so during the writing season, um, there might be road closures or fires. So we're constantly, you know, hearing back from riders and updating our website with the most up-to-date information on, on what's going on. Right. The website is the spot to, to get updates. Someone just asked, actually, it's great that you mentioned this. They just said, hey, where can I get information about conditions and road closures? Yeah, definitely website. We do also have uh, now a Facebook group page for every route that we have. Uh, those are managed by our ambassadors. And um, if people are planning to ride a certain route, we highly recommend that they join as, um, as a group member and they can see ride reports and the latest information on the route. Um, so, you know, also safety and education programs and uh, advertising that we do to promote these programs um, is how we spend money. How do you decide? I have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep them trying to get, ask them in some rational order here. How do you decide where's next? I mean, how do you? How, how you a must... lot of people have asked this in the comments as well. <laughs> everybody, yeah. everybody's I, curious, I, and there's questions about the Oregon Oregon yeah. route. I can't believe someone's got a question about Oregon. I don't believe yeah, that. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so that's the, uh, the Oregon question is the number one question. I, the, the, the what route are you going to do next or how, you, how do you decide is, is also a top question. And it has to do with, generally, us connecting with locals that have the knowledge in a given state or region who've expressed interest and they've kind of, you know, gone through the, the testing with us to be reliable and knowledgeable and, and know what they're talking about. And most importantly, they are willing to put in the time and the effort to do it. So um, that's typically what moves it up the priority. There's a lot of states that we want to do, but um, having the ability to do it um, with local knowledge always makes it um, bubble to the top quicker. And, and uh, an example of that is we were trying to do Wyoming last year and we just didn't have enough local help. It's got a real narrow season because the snow <clears throat> melts away late and it comes early. And so it was a really narrow season to have people from the outside get in there and scout. And so we had to <clears throat> push the Northeast BDR up higher in priority. And the reason we were able to get that done is we had five different locals working with Tim James, who's one of our board members who lives in New Jersey. And he really tapped into a lot of locals that were responsible for a relatively you know, short section but um, by tapping into all that local knowledge and we met some great people and they did a fantastic job. And so that's what put that one on top of the list. Can I ask something really quick about, about that, like using the local knowledge or like individuals being involved with the routes? Um, or do you ever run into an issue where somebody like takes too much ownership, they feel like the route is theirs and then they're like, well, I made this route, you know, they get like kind of pissy at some point or like grumpy. I'm yeah. like, you don't have to go into detail. I'm just really curious if this has come not, up at all. Not naming names. No, it happens. Yeah. It happens a lot. You'll meet someone who's super enthusiastic and then you'll see on Facebook that they've posted that they've created the something or other BDR and they're going to go test it. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. you know, hold yeah. on. <laughs> so yeah, it's hard to balance the enthusiasm, but to keep them in the program and, and you know, the BDR is one of the things that's made it successful is very consistent approach and cons consistent recipe, you know, so we always run north to south, um, we'd make it big bike friendly, it's got to be remote, we avoid population centers, blah, blah, blah. And so some people will have some really amazing riding, but it, it starts by going through a big strip mall and a Walmart and all this and we're like, sorry, we can't have that in no matter how good the riding is, because that takes you out of that backcountry bubble of the backcountry experience. If you look at the New Mexico <clears throat> BDR route, it looks like a backward C where we went, I mean, it was incredibly long, 1200 miles long because we had to go way out of our way to avoid Santa Fe and New Mexico, or Santa Fe and what's the other one? I can't remember the other one down there, but two big population centers that there was great riding in that area, but we just couldn't get in and out of those without strip malls. So we've somehow managed to make 10 routes 
and 10,000 miles of, of BDR terrain without going by almost any strip malls or main population centers. So that's, uh, that's a big criteria that's hard to get people to understand. It's hard to explain that. But sometimes when we go out and scout what they've produced for us, it's, it's just not usable or it doesn't meet our, our standards. So we have to go back to the drawing board. But most of them are take it in stride and, and they understand and they're usually happy with the end result, but uh, that's part of the challenge. I mean, can you imagine running something with this many pieces where every almost everybody's a volunteer, except for Ina? Oh, that's it's what I mean. It's incredibly like... hard to find and to manage and to keep people's expectations. And we tend to work with people that have the financial means to be able to spend the time, but so they almost all own their own business or, you know, they're, uh, I mean, guys like Bill Whitaker, where, you know, he runs a $5 billion business and then he comes and volunteers and has to take direction from Ina. So. Um, but the that, thing that's is, the challenge. Yeah, the thing is that a lot of people don't realize is that we're hundred percent volunteer run organization. There's one staff person. We have a, a couple contractors, you know, social uh, social media manager and administrative help. But everybody else is a volunteer, so they put in their own time, their own finances. Nobody's getting paid for scouting, um, you know, and so. Uh, it's really group effort. Yes, you might have contributed some pieces of this route, but it took a whole group of people to make it a BDR route, not just this, a track that you've been riding all your life, you know, that you've been riding all your life on. Mm -hmm. It's really this whole project together and it's a group effort. It doesn't belong to any one person. Yeah, I think like really seeding into people's minds that it's like a team mentality. This is not like your route. You didn't, yes. like you may have contributed. Um, how did you guys land on the north to south or south to north rather than east to west? Someone, uh, Sam Jones in the audience asked yeah. uh, how the BDR arrived there. So the, the easy answer is that the mountain ranges in North America run north to south. And so that's where the public land in, is. Um, if you get out of the mountains, you end up in farm country where someone owns every piece of dirt and you may not ride across it unless it's a paved road or an easement sort of road. So. That's the reason why they run north south is just because we use the take advantage of the public lands which are generally in or near the mountains. Okay, and I have two more questions really quick. They'll be really fast. I have so many questions and I'm not going to ask all of them, of course, but I'll let Pete get back to his questions after I ask mine. So, number 1, um Oswaldo in the the group has a question. He said, "Can you ask what's the state level support that the BDR receives?" So I'm sure it varies from state to state, but Ina, do you, do you wanna? Yeah, we, uh, because of the economic impact of the BDRs and we were actually able to quanti quantify it um, in a recent economic study that we've done a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and so there's really value for um, states to support the, the creation of a BDR in the state because it brings out of state money uh, mm -hmm. into the state. Uh, and so we, we have been successful in receiving tourism grants from some of the states. Uh, Idaho was one of them, uh, as well as Nevada. And we're currently working with the Wyoming uh, Tourism Office on securing support wow. for uh, the next route, which would be Wyoming, as far as, <laughs> as, far as we know. Um, so yes, we, you know, we've been successful in it. And uh, it's, it just takes a lot of time applying for these grants. And, and it's you know, a pretty small amount of money. Yeah, for the amount of money you get, it, it's a lot of work. But you know, it's sort of a stamp of approval and really shows uh, the importance of the BDR on, on the livelihood of, of- Yeah, grant writing is a huge undertaking for a small amount of money, usually. But, uh, and especially with not having many paid positions at the BDR, you don't exactly have someone to devote their time to that. Um, and one, my last question uh, for now anyway, is um, if people feel that they have, if someone feels that they have like the, you know, secret sauce route to their area, or they've got really something really valuable to share, um, it is the correct route that they become an ambassador and then that, that's how they would uh, relay the information to you guys? Or what's the best way for people to get in touch if they have something to share? Um, they can just contact us uh, at our regular info at writebdr.com email or through the contact form. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people who want to get involved in scouting and being in films and so forth. Uh, and we have a route development committee. So we usually uh, just refer them to the, um, to the chair of the committee. And, and um, you know, if, if the, the person really has valuable information on the route that we're working on, that we'll definitely get them involved. 
Awesome. Yeah. And I just have to say of all that you, the BDR is surrounded by amazing people, like pretty much everybody that I've met that's in some way related to the BDR is uh, an outstanding person. But Tim James is like top notch. I mean, he's like, he is such an awesome guy. You guys just like, I mean, Tim, if you're watching, everybody loves you. You already know that though. <laughs> okay. Back to your question. No, Sorry. He's, he's, in right he's, in, he's in New Jersey. But yeah, Tim, Tim has really carried the organization the last few years. There's nobody that's put more effort in and um, tremendous talent. His, he's got a creative agency at his disposal that he has spent a lot of time doing BDR work pro bono. And so the reason we look so good and, and the reason that people think we're a lot bigger than we are has a lot to do with um, Tim James contributions. Yeah. And he's just got a lot of heart and it shines through, you know, he's like, he's so, he's so invested like with his heart, you know, and it's like, so he's just very passionate about the whole thing. It's really, really neat. Yeah. 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 Uh, he, he and Ina and I work really well together and, and work on almost a daily basis for whether it's email or, or call, but the three of us um, get along really well and appreciate each other. And that's part of what makes it work. So. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think it, it, it is such a huge, uh, part of our success, I think, as an organization behind the scenes is having this amazing group of people with a big heart, um, you know, who are willing to roll the sleeves up and, and work, not just say that I'm going to do this and this and that, uh, but really put in time uh, and not ask anything in return. You know, there's very, I mean, we all have egos, but uh, when we work on the BDR project, there's no egos, you know, it's all for the same cause. Um, and so I, I think that the team, you know, that's at the core of the organization is really like the secret sauce of, you know, why, why we're so successful. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, like, I don't know, I, I worked for a nonprofit just actually right before I came to Moscow, but that's my only real experience other than volunteer work with nonprofits. But I, I feel like there's only so much money you can actually throw at something. Then you need the manpower and the steam behind it. And that has to come from the heart. So you're right. Like at the core of the organization is you guys and then the volunteers and um, the board, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So do you guys ever, uh, you mentioned earlier um, with the relationship with some of the folks that help with the scouting, do you ever get any pushback from the local riding community in the state you're coming to of people being like, protective or concerned about more traffic on the areas that they feel ownership of? Or do you feel that the, how is the response from the local riding groups when you come to, when you come to the state? I can't think of a single time where we've had any resistance from riders or riding groups. Um, the only few wrinkles we've run into is um, local residents that didn't like uh, a road that's near their house being utilized. But even that's been pretty minimal. We've had a few letters and, and that, but you know, we, we utilize public roads that anybody can use with a license plate on your bike or your car. And so that's part of what makes it easy for us is it's all roads that are, you know, public that are available to any, anybody. And so that helps, but it's been surprising to me. We've run into a lot of wrinkles over the years, but that has not been. One of them. Yeah, great. It's not, it's different from like single track and stuff like that, where people are very protective of it because there's so little left you know i feel like with the, the the roads and the forest service roads and stuff like that it's a different ball game um because you don't have quite the same restrictions what so who, so it's it, i feel like sometimes when i'm riding these routes it seems like we're crossing land that's managed by many different organizations like state federal blm maybe even occasionally private property do they cross private property sometimes Generally not, but sometimes if there's an easement or a public road that crosses ranch land, it's it's oftentimes it's private on both sides of the ditch, but the road it's okay to go on. There's an easement, but yeah, sometimes Department of Fish and Game, um, Fish and Wildlife. There's different uh, state trust lands, and there's all kinds of different categories, but it's for the most part public land that's managed by the state or federal. How does the BDR work with those different managers to kind of ensure that the, those lands are going to be available to us to keep riding into the future? So the main thing we do is create this managed form of tourism that utilizes those roads. And most of those agencies are chartered with providing recreational opportunities. Like there's the boat launch for people going fishing and there's, you know, trailhead parking lots for people that are riding. And so they have 
a duty to provide recreation oppor opportunities. And so what we do is show them that there's this viable form of managed travel that's using this road and that road. And so they just view it differently. They're like, ah, this is a part of the BDR. So we need to keep this open because it's important to, to these category of motorcyclists. And it kind of validates the user group and helps keep it open. Um, <clears throat> Tina and I have been to conferences where um, we all of the national or all of the regional um, ac access and dirt bike clubs and people fighting for riding in sand dunes, they all come together for this national conference. And we went there and did a presentation on BDR and we met, you know, lobbyists for the motorcycle industry. We met like top guys from Fish and Game, from BLM. And so they are, they were, a lot of those guys attended our presentation, even though there was different presentations happening and happening at the same time. So they're aware of us, they know the routes that we use. And so they look out for us um, because they're protecting that form of recreation. Uh, but they also use us as a voice to reach the community. The forest service oft, oftentimes reaches out to us and says, Hey, section two on the Colorado has got a forest fire. Please let everybody know, or the winter storm, you know, washed out a certain road. And so they use us to, reach our user group and to let them know about changes on the ground, generally with respect to road closures or forest fires or hazards and things like that. So um, it's, it's kind of cool, it just has evolved over time. You know, we don't go in and talk to them much on the front end, we just go in, create our route, and then usually the relationship kind of happens after, afterwards where they come to know they can use us in a certain way, and they also know which roads um, they should not close because there's people using it. So there's no, you, when you decide to do a new state, you don't have to get permission from anyone. You just go. If we did, we'd still be working on the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Uh, guys, sorry. I just want to interrupt really quick and say that I'm going to invite, before we wrap up here in a little while, I'm going to invite a few people to join us. So for everybody at home, I usually paste this big, long thing of instructions, but I'm not going to do that today because I feel like it gets lost in the chat anyway. So just a few rules. If you come on, make sure that your browser is closed. The one that you're watching us on now, make sure that you close it. Otherwise we'll have this nasty audio feedback. Uh, number two, if you come on and your audio isn't working or your video isn't working, we're not gonna like sit and wait for you to work it out. Sorry, no offense, but we just don't have time. So um, I'm gonna like put you back in the waiting room and you'll have to try again next time, um, but no offense. And uh, I think that's all. So I'm just gonna paste the link and then we can keep chatting and eventually I'll, I'll just like bring someone in and they'll join us and ask a question or share a memory or something like that. And everybody will just give you like a few minutes um, and then I'll kick you off and move to the next person in a nice manner. <laughs> so we'll keep chatting while you're yeah, setting that up. Totally. Okay. What, um, how do you guys decide on the challenge factor? Uh, you mentioned that before, you know, how, how do you decide like, What's that right amount of challenging to be interesting, but not so challenging that it's going to cause problems? And also, what do you ride? What I, I want everybody to know what both of you ride. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a Husqvarna 701 right now. Nice. And, you know, I'm lucky I get to ride whatever the new latest greatest is at, at the Turatech uh, office. So um, I was on an F850 GS for the last one. Prior to that, 1090. I've been on F850s. 1200 GS, Yamaha Super Tenere. All of them, basically all of them. Do you, Paul, I have to ask really quick because I just briefly rode like last year at the Rawhide event, I rode an 850 and I thought that it was worlds better than the 700 or the 800. Yep. Do you, would you agree with that sentiment? Yep, 100%. Oh. Yeah, I wrote a story for the BMW MOA. Um, I went to the press launch and rode the 850 and wrote the story. And in fact, I just finished another story for that magazine about my experience with the F850 riding the Northeast BDR. So that'll be in the next issue of um, oh. BMW MOA. But yeah, I, I loved the bike. Um, I'll have to pick that I'm going to ride the 790 on the next one though. Oh yeah. So uh, so back to that question again, because a part of that actually plays into the bike conversation with people moving towards more middleweight and more nimble, more capable bikes. How do you decide what's the right amount of challenging? Yeah, it's probably the hardest part of the job to find the terrain that's fun and interesting for everybody, but not too hard. But we try and make it so that, you know, an average intermediate rider can make it on a big bike. And um, that's pretty much it. So we want someone to be able to get through it on a 1200 GS. And in some cases, there's something really good, but it's, it's a little bit harder. And so we create um, workarounds. So we'll have the expert only section and then the main route, or and sometimes we'll have the the main route will be difficult and we'll have an easier workaround. So that's how we do it. But we try and make it big bike friendly so that intermediate riding rider on a big twin cylinder bike can, can make it through. 
my next goal, my next big BDR goal is that I'm going to complete a BDR on my 1290. I, I, I just took it like truly off road for the first time a few weekends ago. I think I told you Paul and I was yeah. like so impressed with it. So now I'm like, okay, we got to do a BDR on the 1290. It's really good off road. I rode, I rode Quinn's, which was set up oh, with, a, it, it was mostly stock, had a little bit of suspension tuning and a steering damper, but oh my God, it was so good. <laughs> I was like, God, I mean, I thought that the 1200 also, the first time I rode a 1200 GS, like truly off-road, like on, you know, hard double track or single track, I was like, wow, okay, this thing is really intimidating looking. And of course, once you get going the wrong way, it's like super heavy and a little bit of a pain in the ass, but it's really impressive off-road. Well, I think the 1290 is like up here compared to the 1200 GS. I'm like, it's really good. It's <clears throat> amazing. I can't wait. We that. got, we just got them in the winter, but we haven't had a chance to really put them through their paces yet. So That's yeah, awesome. um, we've been, we've our whole, we, and a, a lot of people were surrounded by have been going smaller and smaller and mm -hmm. smaller with the bikes. And we, we, we felt that pull and we just were like, let's reset this and go right back up to the top. Let's get 1290s. Yeah. And re that level. Um, so That's we're looking one, one of the things I talk to people about is I know there's the, the small bike phenomenon everybody likes smaller is better but when you get something loaded up with all the gear and you're doing like an adventure ride um the lighter bikes i don't like the way they handle with that much weight on them i really like something mid-sized or bigger because it just carries the weight better and they handle so good off-road like your, your 1290 i mean you can put a ridiculous load on that and just get after it and it's super fun so i i tend to like the, the medium size and the larger bikes um and there are people that, you know, want to do it on a 250. I know Ian has done some BDRs on 250s and I just can't pack light enough to have that bike handle right. I like having, you know, a bottle of wine at dinner and my camp chair and I don't know what I else. Did, so we just it. did the Colorado for our team ride last fall. We did the Colorado BDR with our, almost the whole team. We were missing a few people um, and it was epic. It was so amazing. Um, but I just did, that was, uh, that was the smallest bike I've taken on a BDR. I think I did a 450 with only 40 liters of packing capacity. So Paul sitting there, you saying you're wide and chair. I didn't have a chair. I didn't even have pants. I was only wearing my moto pants the whole time. Like I still had a great time of course, but it was definitely like, I was pushing myself on that trip. Okay. Can I do it on the smaller bike? And it was really fun on the small bike while everybody else was like, uh, 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 coming down the mountain passes and crashing every two seconds. I'm like jumping off of everything and sitting down at the bottom and like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's going on? Why are they taking so long? So you get on the highway section and then it's not any fun. No, yeah. then my carpal tunnel is like keeping me awake at night. The wind's the blowing you around and yeah. yeah totally. It could be that the industry swung too large and then it's going to swing too small and it'll sort of we're focusing in because obviously the larger bikes, you can carry more gas, you can carry your supplies. And there's a reason for the larger displacement. So I, I don't think any, I think we're all just, I feel like in a way, this is just a very new sport and we're all just figuring it out, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody's, and there's a lot of people who came into it fresh faced and they're all improving. It's like a whole bunch of skiers hitting a ski hill and all being beginners at the same time. And now they're all advancing into intermediate expert and, and trying to figure out the sport and the equipment and everything else. It's very exciting to watch. I, it's, it's really fun to be part of. Um, you know, what's your next big ride? I'm curious, like, what are, what are you looking out to the future at personally? Like, what are you looking forward to riding when we're able to again? You know, we're thinking of maybe doing the Washington BDR this year, just as a, as a staff ride, as a, as a group ride. Um, I mean, in general, Colorado BDR, which I haven't ridden, would be my top, my number one uh, goal for when I get to ride my motorcycle with my husband again, because usually it's like I go riding, he sits with the kids and vice versa. Yeah, totally. So, but, you know, going back to that question, like it's really such a personal, cho such a personal choice, uh, a small bike versus a larger bike. It depends on, you know, your skills and how well you pack and, and uh you know, how brave you are and so many different um, things that you need to take into account. And so when people call me and say, hey, what's the best bike for the BDR? It's really hard to answer, uh, you know, and also to the point of uh, the difficulty of the roads and routes, we never uh, grade the difficulty of the roads because, you know, one day it might be in perfect condition and you might be on a light enough bike that you're just flying and it's super easy. And then 
you know, a, a storm comes through and, and uh, a group of guys on the bigger, on bigger bikes and the road conditions are terrible. And they call me and say, how could ever anybody do this? Uh, they call you. That's, they call you. The Arizona BDR. Um, so, you know, it, it's really hard to, to, to say. <laughs> yeah, really. he, he hates, like, if we go out on a ride and there are other people with us, they'll be like, well, how hard is it? You know, like, does it get what, harder? Does it get harder? Oh, What's it going to be like? And he's like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm the worst person. I don't even remember. I mean, I have no idea. Wouldn't you just love I, if I, your I, cell phone was oh, ringing? I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine. I feel like rides get more and more fun and then they go to impassable. And so I'm like, I, I don't remember. I have two categories, fun and impassable. And those are my only two categories. And so people are like, does it get a little harder? Does it, how much more? I'm like, I have no idea. Um, they really call you? Do you really get calls from people saying, how could you put this in the BDR? This is way too hard. <laughs> yeah, I've got a call from a guy one time who said, has anybody finished the Arizona BDR? And I said, yeah, I finished it. <laughs> my 250. Uh, but um, yeah. You know, and they ask all kinds of questions like what, you know, what tires should I use? Well, you should have knobby tires. Well, I've ridden BDRs with, uh, or like I've ridden with uh, just regular road tires. I think I'm going to be okay. Well, why are you asking me that? You know, well, do I need to bring extra gas? <laughs> they they <laughs> oftentimes call and ask us a question that they know the answer to, and we give them the answer they don't want to hear, and then they want to argue about it. Like, oh, yeah. should I go yeah. ride by myself? No, you shouldn't, but I'm a good rider. <laughs> Fine, you should ride it. <laughs> no, but I'm like a really good rider. We're like, <laughs> well, I'm that's sure answer, you that's still that be our answer. I, I don't need knobbies. I'm, I can do it without knobby tires. We're like, well, that's fine, but our advice is put knobby tires on. Well, but I don't think I need them. Okay. So that's a lot of Ina's life right there. <clears throat> that's, that's pretty funny. The, cool, the thing I like about that is that, that you know, it's they're new riders. You know, yeah, a lot of those me. questions are probably coming. Not the guy who says, well, I'm a good writer, but the, the, some of these other folks, they're new writers. And so, I mean, those really are not crazy questions. They don't have anyone to ask. And it just shows how the BDR has become this like focal point okay. where they, they got somebody who's new and trying something for the first time and they don't know who to call and they call you, which is actually kind of cool, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, the cool part, you know, they would start the BDR and they're maybe just a beginner ride and then uh, by the end of the 10th day, you're basically, you know, like you're an intermediate pro. Uh, yeah. You really learn so much during these 10 days and, and that's why I love these trips, you know, you can really become such a better rider and, and figure out what works for you because what might work for me, you know, might be different. Um, for someone else so yeah and Ina's okay. gotten really good at going fast on all these BDRs but we're still trying to teach her how to use her brakes <laughs> <laughs> and that was the one thing she said she'd like for other people to do uh, Paul what's your favorite of the routes that you've done that's probably my least favorite question because it's hard <laughs> exactly. to Sorry. what's but, your least favorite question you get from people <laughs> uh, Utah is one of my favorites, I think, because it was the second one that we did. And Utah is amazing. And I hadn't seen very much of Utah. I'd only mountain biked in Moab. So, <clears throat> and I was on a bike that had good suspension. And I was, you know, young and excited and having a ball. So that was super fun. Um, Washington probably was one of my favorites because that was the first one. It was my home state. And I got to see so many things I'd never seen. And it's just a really good route. Most of the rest of them are kind of a blur, like Pete, like you were saying. It's, either, it's like fun and bad so like the it's pretty much they're they're all just fun you know some better than others almost all of them have a couple of roads that are just super bitching fun factor up down twisty where you just can't wipe the smile off your face or like 27 water bars in a row that you're jumping there's every route's got some of that in it and it all just kind of blurs together for me i do remember colorado being super beautiful and the high elevation um but in terms of like fun factor i didn't find those roads as fun as some of the other it was routes. like it was really epic and beautiful like the campsites and yeah. stuff and scenery was insane but you're right like the riding wasn't all that challenging like you know you have the little bits of the, yeah the, the switchbacks were kind of hard but it didn't have a lot of flow to it there's some oh. sections on utah bdr that the roads just had so much flow it's the same thing with mountain biking when you hit that perfect single track and you're like in the zone and it's super fun um and even on that you northeast if you guys come up and do Washington, we may have to join you for a section or something. Like yeah. Yeah. It, it starts in your backyard, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And we actually have like, we won't, we won't dive into this because we've talked about it a couple of times on the live stream, but just to touch on it very lightly on our property, part of the vision with this new place that we just moved into is that we've got like a big 
landing spot for riders to come in during the summer we get tons of people coming through the gorge it's just one of those like break points for different rides and so they'll stop by the shop and we're like god there's not really a good camp spot around here so on the new property we've got like this epic site that actually an excavator is coming out this week to like flatten it and we're gonna have like free motorcycle camping for anybody coming through town so if you guys are here we'd love to host you that would be really really it would be super we would love to host you guys yeah we'll have like a big campfire and um, yeah that'd be sweet so, everybody's being shy at home by the way so it's fine we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up here in a few minutes <laughs> i know and i know we're already going over so thank yeah. you guys for being patient with us um, right. the, uh, is intimidating everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would uh, i would love to hear um about uh, the future of the bdr not just, partly in terms of you know what routes are next i'm sure you get that question all the time um but also just like as an organization how do you guys see this developing and continuing to grow like flash forward you know five years 10 years 50 years whatever your your image of the future is what does the bdr look like at that point you know you want to answer this one or you want me to oh go ahead i'll i'll uh i'll add I have a second okay. part to the question and how can riders like how can the community how can riders as the number of people that are riding these routes grow how can they do their individual part to keep it all open to like be good stewards what mm-hmm. what everybody yeah, so the, the, that t- touches on our, our PSA campaigns. We have Ride Right, which encourages people to ride in the right-hand tire track on two-track, which is really important to minimize head-on collisions. And then the most recent one is Ride Respectfully, which um, we're doing more routes on the East Coast and places where it's closer to where people live. And so we've got sort of the Ten Commandments of how to ride respectfully. But um, it's mainly, you know, rolling off the gas, don't create dust, don't stop and regroup. <clears throat> in front of people's houses, you know, if you're gonna, if nature calls, be discreet and, and things like that. So those are some of the ways that we're trying to um, encourage people to behave in, in a better way to keep the riding um, opportunities open. What was the primary question I was supposed to answer? About, uh, about the future of the BDR organization. So and one of the challenges is to encourage the next generation of riders. You know, a lot of our supporters and enthusiasts are um, getting up there in years and their their days are um, riding days are, are numbered. And we've even had guys that called us and said, I will give you a large sum of money if you create a, a route near where I live because I'm getting old and I want to do this route before, before I'm too old to ride. And we actually um, developed long-term relationships with them. And there is now a BDR near their house and they've been big supporter financially. And so that's cool. But encouraging the future generation of riders Um, to somehow try and manage this ever-growing list of routes that every route has got closures and situations and and it's just um, us trying to manage all that. It's kind of like children, you know, each new child you have is this ongoing care obligation that you have and the more you have, the more work it is. And so that's probably the biggest challenge, how to um, transition from this organization that's mostly volunteers with you know, Super Ina doing the work of three people to a future where we're going to have more staff and more paid people. And um, I even tell Ina every every once in a while that I'm I'm willing to come on full time if, if she'll pay me. But so far, they, yeah, <laughs> they you gotta put, you know, she'll put a listing on Craigslist if she needs you. <laughs> yeah, <Exactly. laughs> that's worked out so well in the past. Um, what and so do you see yourself having a uh, a um, uh, a BDR in pretty much every western state and some regions like mid-atlantic like how how do you see the geographic coverage and could there be more than one uh our friend jan i think jan i can't remember who asked this question but someone said uh could there be more than one route per state is that ever it's possible we've always just done one with some variations but um yeah we're running out of states you know um i remember in the early days people were like oh you got to do two per year you know and if we did that you know we well it wouldn't have never it would have never worked but now we're in this position where you know 10 years in we're sort of running out of states but yes we'll do every western state that we can um, we'll do at least one more on the east coast there might be some opportunities in the um, northern midwest we're not sure but we have people telling us there's possibilities up there from there we'll probably go to other provinces or other countries so we still think yeah, there's some... that was next on my question. I, was, I just like had a vision i was like what about nebraska mm, no yeah. <laughs> some, states, some states do not lend themselves to yeah, it the, the heartland doesn't have much opportunity in general um but yeah i've had um you know drinks <laughs> with other tour tech importers from around the world and and uh you know they uh we talked about doing them in, in foreign countries and they got quite excited about it. And it's kind of like their, 
they've already created the route and we're trying to hold them back, you know, wait till we're, till, right. till we're ready sort of thing, but there's still a lot of opportunities. So it'll, it'll uh, be another good. thing, another thing that uh, I wanted to mention is that JM brought up and I think you guys might have some awareness of him. He's our buddy in Thailand and he came, he came over and did a bunch of routes and you guys and Butler got together to give them all of the maps and everything. So that was really cool. Um, but anyway, JM asked, okay, well, why don't you guys, if you have trouble, like it seems like sometimes there's trouble with keeping everything fully updated on the site. Uh, why don't you let uh, ambassadors update the site? And I thought, oh my gosh, that would be like somebody like updating our Moscow site because they're like, oh, I just learned something new about a product. I'm just going to go update your website. You know, that I could see that being pretty problematic, right? I mean, we, we do have ambassadors that help us keep an eye on the route. Like if the riding season, season is opening and they live close to the route, they'll go and scout it and give us an update. Um, we also use ambas ambassadors to, to um, be the admins of those Facebook groups for each route. Um, but, you know, I probably won't want them to be updating the website. <laughs> we, do, we do have a, a contract administrative person who does help us maintain the website, um, Ina is involved, Tim James is involved, and we also have the, a person um, that works for James Creative Agency that built the website, and so she does some of it as well. So we have her probably four sets of hands that are in the website, and that's currently... Yeah. Uh, I have to say the interactive map, that big update, I think it was, God, it was probably a year and a half ago now. It, it seems like it was just yesterday, but I remember when you guys launched that and it's so impressive. I mean, I've looked at, uh, at doing something similar and gosh, it's just really cool. Very well executed. You guys do a great job with the site, I think. Yeah, yeah we have a, a volunteer or ambassador, Jill Oliver, that yeah, um, works. Jill. Yeah, she works in that space. So she she did the heavy lifting on that. But yeah, it's cool that you, you can look at the the snow layers. Like the other day I was trying to figure out for trail running where where I could go where there wouldn't be snow. So I pulled up the BDR website on my cell phone, went to the the Wobder page, and then just looked at the snow levels in the areas where I'm going hiking or, or running. And so it's pretty useful. You can also look at forest fire activity, which is important in the summertime. And so yeah, it's super powerful. That was wow. Jill, that was all Jill though doing that. And it's been a huge addition to the user experience. I wondered, I know you guys mentioned that you have your Facebook pages, but with so many writers with ADV writer, so much crossover into ADV writer, I just thought someone said open source it, you know, about the website. And I was like, ah, I don't know about that. But what if you had a, what if you had an ADB writer? You've probably thought about this, but what if you had like a BDR vendor thread? And I'm sure that they would allow it in the vendor threads on ADB writer, where it was sort of an open source information share just about BDR. Um, so there, there are a number of BDR threads on ADB writer, oh. some for individual routes. Um, we did recently, Tim, our colleague, created a BDR user name and password, and he he does a little bit on that. But we in the old days we would just send people to ADB Rider. A lot of times Ina gets questions or we get a question at a trade show. Yeah, I, I want to go ride it, but I don't have anyone to ride with. I'm trying to, you know, connect, connect with some other people. And so that's the reason we created those Facebook pages. Yeah. Uh, we initially launched a forum, but it was a nightmare to manage and filled up with spam and it was, we just couldn't deal with it. So that's why we use the Facebook platform. And we just have, uh, um, not administrators, but we have ambassadors that work as, as moderators on that. And so that's something we've done recently. And that seems to be working pretty good where people can um, talk about, you know, what, what roads open and, hey, let's go ride on this date. And, and so that has served that need for us pretty well. We're just getting started with it. We need more moderators and more people using it. But um, we think that's the right platform for yeah, that information. There's also more features on the Esri uh, digital maps that are on our website that we're currently not using, but sometime in the future when we have more time uh, and Jill can devote more time, people will be able to, um, you know, be on the route and uh, put in the uh, user generated coordination and say, hey, there's like a log here or, or road has washed out or something like that so kind of uh, in lifetime um comments on on the routes but we haven't there's a capacity to do that with the current maps we just haven't gotten there yet yeah cool awesome. hey guys it's been so awesome having you on tonight thank you so much for taking the time um we're it's already 8 23 i like i told you the time just flies by i don't know how it happens but it does mm -hmm. um and i just love sitting here like hearing about the history of the bdr and also like dreaming up the future and what it could look like and reminiscing um it, it's really it's really been neat so thanks for thanks for coming on tonight and one quick note before we go 
um, to everybody at home, the t-shirt that I'm wearing, they have arrived finally. So these t-shirts will go to support COVID relief uh, in the Northwest, um, specifically to our kind of local area. So any profits from the t-shirt sales uh, will go towards that. So um, please make a purchase when they're available, which should hopefully be Wednesday. So those will be up on the site. There's a pretty limited number. I think I got like 80 shirts or something. So, and you too, I'll send you one in the mail just because thanks well, for being on. I want to also just say uh, yeah. thank you guys for everything you've done in creating this organization yeah. for, uh, as a writer, you know, we've been a benefit. I've personally been a beneficiary. Ashley and I have uh, of the routes that are amazing. And then also as a business person, what you've done for the industry and for the sport, just like I said before, it just can't be overstated. So thank you guys so much yeah. for everything you It's do so to, neat to have this to nugget of like information and knowledge to pass on to people when they're inspired by, by writing. You can say, well, check this out. And yeah. it's just this wealth of knowledge and information and, and inspiration. Like you said, Ina, the films, you know, it might be easy for someone from the outside to look at the photography and the films and say, well, that's a little extra, you know, do you really need that? But what it does is it like sparks that interest, just like it did for me when I sat in the audience at, at the Seattle premiere of the Arizona film and I looked up and thought, wow, oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm doing it. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your support of the BDR. It's companies like you that um, get out your checkbook and send us a big check, you know, once a year and do other things, you know, the supporter package. I know you guys have just been there. Um, anytime we need something, we know that you'll be there to support it. So uh, thank you for your ongoing support. Absolutely. Honor, honor to be yeah, and it. please yeah. let's let's make that thing happen when you guys come and do the Washington route. It would be so cool to link up at least for a day or so. Yeah, it'd be awesome. That's cool. Awesome. Okay, bye.